Good morning, and it's nice to see a bunch of familiar faces, although in a much bigger room than what we've been used to in the past. Today I'll present Hebert's projections for our natural fibers industries, and what I'd like to do is to set the scene a little bit for the outlook over the next few years. Now Australia is a big player in both of these industries. It's the world's largest exporter of wool, and possibly this year, if our forecast is right, um, the second largest exporter of cotton. This year, the story is really a supply, a supply side one, with the contrasting situation in each industry pointing in opposite directions for our price projections. So let me start first with wool, and let me just summarize some of the su uh, supply and demand influences that continue to drive our forecasts. On the demand side, the effect of the economic downturn in the European Union and the US is slowly wearing off. Some positive signals in the retail sectors of both the US and in Europe suggest demand is slowly strengthening, although we're not out of the woods quite yet. Demand from China, the principal export market for Australian wool, and the dominant wool processing country in the world remains strong. Retail demand for wool and apparel in China is what has sustained the demand for Australian wool over the past few years. And looking forward, according to the Economist Intelligent Unit forecasts, China by 2016 is projected to surpass Japan as the world's largest luxury good market and to surpass the United States to become the world's largest retail market. So China's importance to Australia as a consumer of our natural fibers cannot be overstated. Last, and a bit on the downside, the strength of the Australian dollar continues to put some downward pressure on export earnings, which has dampened the positive effect of the strengthening demand that has just come about in recent months. As for the supply side, the world supply of wool was slightly lower last year, with a trend towards alternative land use in places like New Zealand and Argentina. And in South Africa, it's been slow to rebound from the Rift Valley disease outbreak of a number of years ago and continues to deal with predation issues. Now, with these sorts of issues going on, there is no significant change expected in world wool production this year. And going forward, world wool production will depend on the strength of demand for wool and for sheep meat and the flexibility that producers have to respond to these market signals. Stocks. The International Wool Textile Organization estimates that the stocks to use ratio is quite low, at about 11%. High wool prices two years ago were behind a significant sell down of wool stocks in some countries. And without any significant growth in world wool production and with low stocks, this will assist prices um, going forward as demand strengthens. And that bodes well for our industry. Any real increase in world wool production will likely come from Australia, although not so much this year given the poor seasonal conditions in some areas and also with the composition of the flock at this moment in time. Now, what I'd like to do is I'm going to look at some of these factors in more detail, but I want to start first with what influence they've had on prices. Wool prices continue to be affected by the economic conditions of the EU and the US. Prices between 2011 and the first half of 2012 were generally downward trending because of weak consumer demand for wool and apparel in, the, in Europe, in America and in Japan. At the same time, there was the influence of increased offerings at auction for fine and super fine wools at a time when discretionary spending on consumer products was weak and that all put further downward pressure on prices. Prices began to turn around in September of last year and the rise has continued into this year. With global wool supply affected by what's going on in the competing wool exporting countries, combined with some indications of that strengthening demand, wool prices are expected to remain relatively firm for the remainder of this year, but averaging at about 1,050 cents a kilogram clean. Next year, with this more positive price expectation, we expect the expansion of the domestic flock to continue, and I'd like to turn to that now. Australian sheep numbers increased 5% to 76 million head at the end of June last year. Producer intentions of further flock rebuilding this year have been stymied a bit by hot, dry summer conditions in the major sheep producing region, regions. And for that reason, closing sheep numbers are forecast to remain roughly unchanged this year. But assuming improved seasonal conditions next year and in response to improving wool prices, we expect, we expect the flock expansion to continue. 
And that expansion will likely be achieved in the same way as in the past couple of years, with over half the flock comprised of breeding ewes and lambs. Now this graph is different to the one in the Australian commodities that you might have in your satchels, which only contains the adult sheep flock. I've included lambs in this graph. And the reason is because even though there's an emphasis on increasing the number of weathers in the flock, because there is such a high proportion of ewes and lambs, it has kept the average fleece weight down. And that has put a, a that has dampened how quickly Australian wool production has been able to increase in response to stronger prices. Now, let me just turn your attention to wool production in Australia and to see where the industry is expected to head. In the short term, Australian greasy wool production is forecast to be slightly down this year at 360,000 tonnes, before increasing to about 368,000 tonnes next year. This is expected to come as a result of a rise in the number of sheep shorn and an increase in the number of weathers in the flock. It will be these same fundamentals that will continue to push production up over the projection period, albeit modestly. Because as you can see in the graph, at the end of the projection period, we still don't project Australian wool production to be as high as it was even just five years ago. As for the price forecast, given the supply and demand factors we've looked at, Abares is forecasting a 12% increase in the EMI next year, given the assumed strengthening of economic activity in, each of the wool, in, in many wool-consuming countries of Western Europe and in the United States going into 2013, which is consistent with some of the messages that Paul Morris spoke about yesterday in the economic overview. Now, that should improve the demand for discretionary consumer products, and it's into that category where wool and apparel falls. Improved economic activity in China as well, with strengthening personal incomes, will likely lead to an increase in China's domestic demand for wool apparel. And China is already responsible for consuming more than half of the wool apparel it produces. And as, a, as an aside, and looking away from this graph, and even beyond just the medium term, or in terms of uh, outlook space, there has been some analysis done of late, um, not necessarily at Abair, sort of beyond, but at the emerging demand in emerging economies such as Brazil and Russia, as the incomes in those countries increasing, and as spending on luxury items are also increasing. And particularly in Russia, where there has been and there is an ongoing resource boom, there's a much larger number of rich people spending a lot more money on things like luxury items, jewelry, big cars, and fancy clothes. And just with the idea that if this trend should continue, there'll be another source of demand for woolen apparel is another signal that perhaps there'll be more behind the push for demand for our product going into the future. Well, I'll just come back down to the forecast now, and I want to turn to what our expectation is for wool prices over the medium term. And what we have in real dollars, 2012-13 dollars, by the end of the projection period, our price is at about 1,200 cents a kilogram clean. Of course, in nominal terms, that will be higher. Let's turn now to what it means for Australian exports. The volume of exports this year is expected to be slightly lower than last year, but more significantly, it's export earnings which are going to take a big hit. We expect them to be about 18% lower than last year at about $2.6 billion. And this reflects the lower prices and also the relatively high exchange rate. Next year, the volume of exports is expected to lift, but, and we'll also be seeing a lift in um, export revenues to about $3 billion. So I'll just summarize the forecast now. Looking beyond this year, we see in 2013, we expect the EMI to be about 12% higher than this year, averaging 1,180 cents a kilogram clean, as demand strengthens. Shorn wool production is forecast to be up only slightly at 368,000 tons. And the export volume is expected to be up slightly as well, but it's in, uh, export earnings that will really lift up to about $3 billion, which is an increase of about 14% from where they're expected to be this year. China continues to be the good news story because of the income growth that is occurring there, which is sustaining our total exports, and which will, over time, it's projected to lead to stronger demand for finer wool apparel. Over the medium term, provided the economies in Western Europe and the United States strengthen more solidly, as per our forecasts in the economic overview, we expect an increase in demand for wool and apparel. And there are no indications that the Australian shorn wool production will decrease, given the investments by producers into the expansion of their flocks. 
So while a gradually increasing supply could moderate an upswing in prices somewhat, prices are still projected to remain, remain firm. And now I'd like to move on to Australia's second natural fibre, that of cotton. On the demand side, like for wool, economic growth in apparel importing countries is a positive for cotton demand, not just in developing con developed countries, but also in developing countries. Meal consumption is increasing after last year's eight-year low, and the reason for growth is twofold. One is the favorable cotton to polyester price ratio that Paul might be talking about a bit coming up. And also apparel consumption, especially in India, Pakistan, Turkey and Bangladesh, all countries that also pr uh, uh, produce cotton, it's on the rise. On the supply side, world production this year is expected to be higher than consumption for the third year in a row. And as a result, stocks are at a record high. And it is this element, this supply of cotton worldwide, this availability of cotton, that will be having an effect on our projection for prices over the next five years. Here at home, water availability for irrigated cotton remains very good and should sustain production for at least another year or so. Now let's take a look at what that means for world prices and production. World prices are expected to fall about 15% compared to last year, and this is mostly driven by record high world closing stocks of cotton. This price is considerably below where we were two years ago when there was a world shortage of cotton, but in relative terms, it's still favorable. Given the fall in prices, world cotton production is forecast to decrease 4% to about 26 million tons as farmers switch to crops with higher expected returns like corn and soybeans. Production is expected to be down in all countries except China and the United States. But where the United States is concerned, that's really a recovery because they've had three years of poor seasonal conditions, so they're just getting back up to where they were four years ago. Next year, world cotton production is forecast to fall further as producers take advantage of the more favorable returns for those alternative crops. But over the medium term, things are expected to turn, to turn around somewhat in, uh, because of strengthening demand. When you have a forecast for higher production, combined with soft consumption as we've had over the past few years, you have a buildup of stocks, as I mentioned, and I'd like to touch on that now. This year, as you can see by my nice yellow star, is really an outlier year. For about the past decade, the average world cotton stocks to use ratio has been about 52%, and this year we're expecting it to be at 77%. This increase reflects the rise in world production combined with more subdued consumption growth globally. World cotton closing stocks are forecast to be 19% higher this year at 18 million tons. And the higher closing stocks are expected in almost all major cotton producing and consuming countries. But really driving this increase is China where the government has added 5.8 million tons to its national cotton reserve by importing 2.7 million tons and getting the remainder from its own domestic consumption. Now, 5.8 million tons on a total world closing stocks of 18 million tons is roughly a third. So it's a significant player in this increase in world closing cotton stocks. Going forward, stocks are expected to decline at an average rate of about 6% over the projection period, given the forecast decline in world cotton production and growth in meal consumption. But even at that expected rate, at the end of the projection period, we're only a tick below the 10-year average. So that will have an influence on prices, as I mentioned. Now, I'm just going to bring things back home and have a look at how the domestic industry is going. Australian cotton production has been strongly influenced this season by the falling price of cotton relative to grain sorghum. The fall in cotton prices has led to a 15% reduction in the area planted to, co to cotton, with the vast majority of that coming out of dry, the dryland cotton area. In fact, 85% of the dryland cotton area was put into grain sorghum. The irrigated cotton producing areas have benefited again from an adequate supply of irrigation water, as well as from hot and dry weather, which up to a couple of weeks ago when our forecasts were finalized, um, was expected to lead to better than average yields. 
But our analysts did a ring around the major cotton growing areas to see what kind of impact the recent rains have had. And while there was sort of mixed reviews on what the rains could have, the general feeling was that A, people wanted the rain to stop before yields were detrimentally affected. And two, there might be some downgrade to quality. But we'll review that later on, perhaps for our June forecast. With lower area planted to cotton, the forecast is that cotton lint production will be down at least 20% compared to last year's record 1.1 million tons. If this forecast is realized, it would be the second largest on record. But given the seasonal rains, again, we'll just have to put a bit of a question mark over that. Over the medium term, after three years of high cotton production, Australian production is projected to decline steadily to 2017-18 as grower returns decline. Let's turn now to exports. Because cotton exports are largely sold in the year after they're produced, exports are expected this year to actually rise to 1.1 million tons. With harvest this year also forecast to be large, Australia has the potential to be the second largest cotton exporting country behind the United States. Over the past few years, we've been ranked third behind the US and then India. As production gradually declines over the projection period, exports will follow suit. So what does that mean for grower returns at the gin gate? Returns to Australian cotton growers from this cotton, from cotton lint are forecast to be down about 20% this year, in line with the world trend in prices, to about $450 a bale of lint. In line with movements in world prices, returns to Australian cotton growers are projected to remain relatively steady in real terms over the projection period. So I'll just summarize some of the key messages. The cotton indicator price next year is expected to strengthen a bit to about 88 US cents a pound, given lower world cotton production and the expectation of further recovery in cotton consumption. Australian production next year is forecast to be lower at about 905,000 tonnes, as are exports given the forecast decline in production. Over the medium term, given world production growth, world stocks will increase significantly this year before tapering off over the medium term. And at the same time, world prices in real terms are pro projected to fluctuate between 84 and 86 US cents a pound, as the influence of declining production is offset by strengthening consumption. And it is this gradual strengthening of world demand which will assist the world price over the medium term for not falling even further. Thank you very much. <laughs>